where the silver came from, it didn't come from the managed money. In other words, the managed money are usually the ones that sell the silver to the commercial banks. In essence, it came from the producers this time, meaning the managed money wasn't selling it, and, and the commercial banks pickpocketing them the way that they've been doing for a very, very long time. In this case, managed money said, no, we're not going to sell that silver to you. And it was purchased by the producers. This is telling me that we are getting very close to that moment where the commercial banks realize that being short, naked short, in a market where a country like India can import 45 million ounces of silver in a month is as stupid as a mud wall and they're going to bail. And we can see, it seems as though, almost as though that's indeed what they are doing. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but when I look at silver today, uh, up over a dollar uh, to 31 and change, 31.20, uh, I think it is one of these days that is exactly what is going to happen is that they will let it run to the upside, realizing that the only way to manipulate a market done again over an extended period of time is to push it in the direction that it is going. And I think they are realizing this is a game that is is cross the line of being foolish and is now into, you know, um, sink or swim. And I also think you will we will witness a period of time where all of these commercial banks start to eat their own. In a shocking twist, the eight largest commercial banks holding naked short positions in silver are on the verge of collapse, with India importing a staggering 45 million ounces of silver in just one month. These banks are starting to scramble. Andy Sheckman reveals they're quietly unwinding their positions, signaling a seismic shift in the market. This is unprecedented. For the first time, producers, not managed money, are selling silver. As Sheckman points out, the banks are realizing that being short in this market is a game they can no longer win. Could this be the moment the silver market explodes? Look, I just think it's absurd that that the the way that the Federal Reserve um, and their their open market committee uh, applies what they believe is the the preferred rate for millions of savers and borrowers and spenders and uh manufacturers and and on and on and on and and i guess to me what i find most humorous is how they are trying to gaslight us into believing inflation is being has been defeated and it's important to understand that the cpi is a worthless statistic um and it's it's intended to conceal the the debasement of the currency and it's happening at a rapid pace one of the things i found very interesting about the the 50 basis point cut, you know, you had everyone saying 25 basis points, maybe 50. You know, we go all the way back to the beginning of the year and see how how many times they've changed uh, their their strategy. There there wasn't going to be any rate cuts. There's going to be four rate cuts, um, and here we are. We finally got this rate cut, a 50 basis point, and here we are. We look at you know we look at gold. It's it's up to basically it's all time high today. Silver's up back again above 31. But one of the things that I found interesting is that actually Treasury yields went higher on the on the back end of the of the curve. And and that to me signals big trouble ahead for the Federal Reserve. If they're lowering rates and the back end goes higher, but that that's the way it should be if you're thinking logically that a government has given in to inflation, raised the 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 white flag and and said you know we're going to focus on our on our dual mandate of, of full employment which is a bunch of nonsense and in essence they're doing what all governments have done they're giving in uh, to inflation and 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 um, you know taking the easier path rather than uh, tightening their belt and choosing austerity they have done what all governments have done and they have pivoted and and it, it's um, I don't know. I think ultimately this leads to some 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 real problems as we continue down the road. Uh, I found it also interesting too, just in in reading some articles last night about John Paulson, the the billionaire hedge fund manager, who who has finally said what others have figured someone like him would say, and that is that if Kamala wins the presidency, he will pull nine billion dollars in assets from various sectors. Um, because of, of, of what she is proposing, in particular, raising the capital uh, gains tax, raising the corporate tax, and introducing a 25% unrealized gain on people just like Mr. Paulson. And he warned that if she were elected, 
that this would lead to mass selling and market crashes. And we've been talking about that. There's there's no question. But the bottom line is, is that when I look around, I just I see that we are at a point right now, Dunnigan, where there is no escape from not only the constantly depreciating currency, but also from this math massive debt, that burden that we have that continues to grow. And, and I think they figured that well, this inflation, which is a hidden tax, is a lot easier than continuing to raise taxes. Uh, and this is done at a time when, you know, our stocks are up around all time highs. Uh, our deficit is at all time highs. We've redlined the national debt. And then you get these fake numbers like the CPI and the jobs numbers. And um, it, it, it's, it's very difficult for the average person to understand exactly what is happening. But when you talk about these fake numbers, like the job numbers we talked about last week, 1.3 million uh, Americans lost their jobs, replaced by 635,000 people, most of which were um, in this country illegally and part-time jobs at that. Uh, switching gears just a little bit to uh, to gold and silver, just a couple things I want to talk about, and, and we can move on. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about over the last few years of India importing copious amounts of silver. And you know their gold numbers are up very high also, but India looks at silver in a very strategic manner. They imported almost 46 million ounces of silver just in August. That's uh, around today's numbers. That's worth about 1.3 plus billion dollars, over 45 million ounces of silver um, in the month of August. And and you annualize that out, they are continuing on a pace that that is literally draining all of the exchanges and. Uh, you wonder how long the six or seven or eight commercial banks who have been short are able to continue to play this game. It's interesting, and also in looking at the the um, commitment of traders numbers that just came out, it's as if the commercial banks are, are pivoting and changing the way that they are doing things. They are covering their positions, and they covered quite a bit recently, just the other day, and I noticed in looking at where the silver came from, it didn't come from the managed money. In other words, the managed money are usually the ones that sell the silver to the commercial banks. In essence, it came from the producers this time, meaning the managed money wasn't selling it, and, and the commercial banks pickpocketing them the way that they've been doing for a very, very long time. In this case, managed money said, no, we're not going to sell that silver to you. And it was purchased by the producers. This is telling me that we are getting very close to that moment where the commercial banks realize that being short, naked short, in a market where a country like India can import 45 million ounces of silver in a month is as stupid as a mud wall and they're going to bail. And we can see, it seems as though, almost as though that's indeed what they are doing. Now, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but when I look at silver today, uh, up over a dollar uh, to 31 and change, 31.20, uh, I think it is one of these days that is exactly what is going to happen is that they will let it run to the upside, realizing that the only way to manipulate a market done again over an extended period of time is to push it in the direction that it is going. And I think they are realizing this is a game that is has crossed the line of being foolish and is now into, you know, um, sink or swim. And I also think you will we will witness a period of time where all of these commercial banks start to eat their own. It will not be about a, a coordinated, collusive agreement the way we've seen these eight banks short uh, on your interview with, with Ed Steer and the chart that we talked about a few times now. It, it appears as though they've been doing this in a coordinated, corroborated fashion, and I think that will change. They will start to realize it's every man for himself. Uh, one last thing I want to talk about is gold. <clears throat> and, you know, we talk a lot about about Saudi Arabia, we talk a lot about gold importation by these countries, a lot of de-dollarization. And it just came out that the Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority secretly, and that's the key here, secretly purchased 160 tons of gold from Switzerland. And that was uh, discovered because of the import data that goes through Swiss customs data. Now, most of these governments, I would argue, have been secretly purchasing gold and silver and all sorts of other de-dollarization uh, techniques for the better part of the last three, four years. It's just these, this time the, the Saudis got caught with their hand in the cookie jar. And, you know, again, in the, in the month of August, massive imports, 160 tons of gold in the month of August. Well, how much more did they get away with that people didn't catch? 
or that the customs data didn't report or that was purchased through sovereign wealth funds through different um, channels that are not reported to the IMF or, or through customs data, I would argue quite a bit. But I read an article, um, there's a man um, named John Little and he's, he's a hell of a researcher and I, I quote his statistics quite a bit. Um, and he, he wrote something down that I, I just wanted to, to kind of regurgitate here because when you think about it, it becomes really interesting. You know, we talk about how gold, in many cases, at least I think it is, is replacing the dollar, uh, at least on a geopolitical uh, macro scale. You see these countries that are de-dollarizing, and, and in many cases, it appears as though oil has been remonetized, so has gold. These two assets are worth more than the dollars that purchase them. And he wrote something that I, I kind of updated it here today. It's a little different than what he wrote, but I want people to think about things this way and why these countries are so keen on, on purchasing gold. With gold right now today at $25.90 and oil today at $70 a barrel, one ounce of gold can purchase 37 barrels of oil. And so the, the, the analogy he made was a woman's purse that could hold, uh, he called it a 20 pound capacity purse that could hold 290 ounces of gold. And, and that's not too, you know, we always talk about you could take a backpack full of gold and run to the car. So 290 ounces of gold right now is worth at, uh, at 25.90, we'll call it. 290 times 25.90, that's worth 751,000 bucks that you could put in a purse and run to the car. Well, that is worth today 10,730 barrels of oil. So when we talk about how this is unfolding and why these countries are choosing oil and, or gold instead of dollars, not only has it outperformed the 10-year treasury two to one, as we've talked about, not only is it a, an asset that has no counterparty liability with it, if it's in your own possession, as these governments are, are quickly realizing, of course, but at the same time, it, it's outperforming and gold continues to march higher uh, at, at nearly a 10% compounding year over year return. So these are things that are happening under the seams. But when you look at a country like India, when you look at a country like Saudi Arabia, they're showing it to you. And either you get past the recency bias and the normalcy bias or you don't. But um, we are at a very interesting point in time, politically, geopolitically. Um, and these are the things that are beginning to unfold that I think you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see these ramifications. Now that you understand the game-changing moves happening with the biggest banks and the silver market, you're going to want to stay ahead of what's coming next. The financial landscape is shifting fast and there's more you need to know to stay informed. So make sure to check out our next video where we dive into the next major market move that could impact your investments. Trust me, you won't want to miss it.